Okay, so I think everybody's here now. So I'd like to welcome everyone to, to the part two of today's seminar, Familial Legacies. And in this discussion, the topic of uh, focus will be cultural, um, it'll be a making of a culture of making. So joining us for this panel discussion today, we have the National Design and Craft Gallery Generation Exhibition Curators, Mirren Charlton and Frances MacDonald. So Mirren is going to lead this panel discussion and she will be joined by three of the exhibition makers. We have Catherine West, Roisin de Butler, and we also have Hugo Byrne. Also joining us from the Design and Craft Council Ireland will be Louise Allen. So throughout this uh, panel discussion, you are very welcome to type any of your uh, comments or questions in the right hand side of your screen in the chat section or underneath in the middle center in the Q&A section. Towards the end of the conversation then, we will relay your questions back to the panel. I will now pass you over to Mirren Charlton who will begin this session. Thank you. Thanks Caroline and welcome everybody. You're all very welcome um, this afternoon to our session on the culture of making as part of the exhibition generation um, at the Design and Crafts Gallery, the National Design and Crafts Gallery in Kilkenny. And of course, it's now an online virtual exhibition. So in particular, I want to welcome our special guest speakers today, Roisin, Hugo and Catherine. It's such a privilege to have the opportunity to talk to you uh, this afternoon. So thank you so much for being with us. And for all our audience who've logged, who've logged in to be with us as well, you're all really welcome. And uh, thanks for joining us. Um, and also to the co-curator, Francis MacDonald, who's here as well. And I'll just start by saying one or two um, short things uh, about working with Francis on the exhibition generation. We met, I, I would think it's probably about two, if not more years ago, and we were talking about craft and what we both were passionate about, uh, which is the history of craft in this country, in Ireland, and the legacy that it has uh, today. Um, and it's just been such a pleasure working on this exhibition with Francis. And the whole theme of this exhibition, the curatorial question, is really to bring to the public for the question of how important our cultural legacy uh, of craft making um, and tradition of making is in this country. So there's eight makers in the show uh, all together, and we have three of them here, here with us. The, the exhibition crosses all disciplines, so we wanted it to showcase the, the wide variety of ways in which the, the theme of uh, intergenerational sharing of skills is passed on, um, and also how that work, that legacy continues on and is reinterpreted today in the 21st century Ireland. So I want to just call on our first speaker um, and I'm going to introduce Catherine West. Um, I've known Catherine for many years now and it's, I'm just delighted you're here, Catherine, with us. And just to say a little bit about Catherine. Um, so so uh, Catherine is um, a graduate of the NCAD uh, in, in Dublin and she currently lectures uh, in design, in ceramic design and industrial design uh, in GMIT in Galway. Um, Catherine grew up uh, with the backdrop of an easel and paints um, and an artist studio, uh, you know, in her home. Her mother was um, Margaret Irwin West um, and this exposure to visual art from a very early age um, influenced uh, Catherine and she's going to speak about that now. Um, Catherine's work explores collective memory, uh, including our connections with the past, uh, the present object, function and space. And in particular, and really um, in an extraordinary way, her forms explore folds or pleats uh, of matter and how they relate to, to the void and to the human form and to space. Um, so also, uh, Catherine, your brother uh, is a maker as well, uh, Richard uh, West, and just to kind of bring him in as well, and he makes wooden vessels and his work is part of the show. So Catherine, um, you're also a, a Fulbright uh, alumna, um, but can you maybe begin by telling us a little bit about growing up um, with your mother, uh, the, the printmaker Margaret Irwin West, and, and what that experience of the culture of making was like for you? Uh, absolutely, I'd love to. I thought, um, first of all, we might just look at an image by my grandfather, um, H.E. West. I don't know, Caroline, if you can pull up that, that image. And I thought I might just start with the statement from um, Tim Ingold um, uh, from his book, Making, um, where he says, making creates knowledge. 
builds environments and transforms lives. And so I think that's kind of primordial, you know, in a way. And uh, so uh, I was very lucky to grow up in a very visual um, uh, family background environment. Um, one of my kind of introductions to visual art was um, we had a very uh, dark uh, dining room uh, in the bottom of our house and uh, on every wall there were several uh, paintings um, that were copies of Dutch masters by my grandfather, H.E. West. So he was a businessman during the day and then at night he, he, he made copies of Vermeers and Hals and uh, all kinds of Dutch masters, Rembrandts. So I used to go into this dining room and um, literally uh, you know, enter those, those, those environments. Those Dutch masters are very particular in terms of, you know, they're, they're mostly interiors and you can kind of enter into a whole world once you look at them. Uh, so I think that was, um, you know, a very uh, particular uh, introduction to visual art that I had. And I could go in there anytime I wanted. The piano was in there, these beautiful paintings were in there. And there were other objects, historical objects from, from my family, um, from my mother's uh, childhood in India, uh, all those kinds of things. So it was really a kind of an amazing space to go into. Uh, then um, we could go on to the image of the Cubist painting by my mother, um, Caroline. Uh, then, you know, as a child, um, as I was growing up, my mother, uh, her studio was in her bedroom. Um, <laughs> very different times. Uh, so she had a big bay window and the easel was literally in her, in the bay window. And so, uh, I, you know, it wasn't easy for her to try and paint with four children, um, but she did. Uh, she was extraordinarily uh, determined. Uh, so we grew up with that, that easel and those tubes of paint and the smell of oil paint. And, and my mother literally making work in front of us. Uh, so that was very, very special. And uh, not so many years ago, she had a retrospective in Dublin. And um, what my brother and I found most extraordinary was that we hadn't seen some of the paintings for... 30, 40 years, maybe more, maybe 50 years even. Um, and uh, it was like us finding old friends again because we'd literally seen them evolve as children. And uh, so that was very, very special. And then um, we can move on to the image of the Colmar landscape, yeah. Um, landscape uh, was, a, was a big, big uh, influence also, both for my mother and myself. Um, I grew up uh, beside the water. Um, and uh, as a child, uh, you know, we were always outside and uh, um, uh, often my mother was, was, was drawing and painting while we were playing on the beach or swimming or lolling around. Um, so, uh, you know, we were often, um, watching her draw, um, you know, uh, and observe the landscape. And she used to encourage us to look at the landscape in particular ways. And um, she was a huge um, influence on the way I uh, look at uh, objects in space and, and, and draw and observe. Um, so uh, I was very lucky. You know, a lot of people don't get taught how to draw from a very young age, but I, you know, I was very lucky. Uh, my mother was quite exigent in terms of, you know, when you were, when you were drawing something, it's like, no, you hold the pencil this way and, you know, perspective and, you know. <laughs> so, so oh, I was very lucky. And then um, we also had a lot of visits to galleries as well. Um, uh, the National Gallery, you know, the paintings, some of the paintings there were like old friends as well. And, um, so just, just, you know, so that, that, that was very important. And um, I suppose as time went on, then I started to, to draw the, the, the landscape. I mean, what's kind of interesting about the fact that I started making objects was that um, 
I think I'm somebody who can absorb uh, kind of um, visual material and observe it, um, but I'm not somebody who can, um, you know, put together um, uh, imaginative composition, you know, so I was never going to be a painter. Um, I was much more someone who uh, was interested in, in forms and space and, um, you know, uh, in fact, my brother and I both took uh, pottery classes when we were small, um, we're just 16 months apart, and uh, my mother would be teaching on a Saturday morning and we'd take pottery classes in the, um, in the art school in Galway, uh, in um, Tanleary. And uh, so we kind of, you know, we were manipulating materials from a young age and also you know, we didn't have a television and things like that. So, so making was just part of life. And even down to, you know, we all, the sewing machine was always on the table too. And if we were going out, we, we'd try and make something quickly on the sewing machine as well. You know, it was just, it was a, I suppose it was a particular way of living that um, a lot of people lived that way then, I think. Um, uh, Catherine, if I could just put, sorry to cut across you there, but I think that's a really, really good point that might come up in our discussion at the end about living in a, that culture of making and, um, you know, which hopefully is coming back again. Um, but you mentioned drawing and the value that was placed on looking, um, mm. which is so wonderful. So what began your journey then into ceramics? Was it those early, early pottery classes? And uh, how did you emerge with your own voice then within, within oh, yeah. ceramics? Well, I think the pottery classes were just, you know, like the fun of making things out of uh, a malleable material. But then I went on to, you know, I went on to art school and um, I thought actually I'd do something called design, you know, in a kind of vacuous sort of way. I didn't really know what that would really involve. Um, but really at that time, I suppose the, the main emphasis in design was kind of... Um, in more graphic design at NCAD. So um, then, uh, yeah, I just decided that what I particularly liked doing was, was, was working with materials and particularly with clay. And I, did, I was lucky, you know, I kind of rediscovered clay then, I suppose, and realized that that was something that uh, I, I uh, particularly responded to. Um, uh, I, I think as well, you know, the, 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 the material is so malleable. I think that was something that uh, kind of fascinated me um, with clay. Whereas, you know, we did work with Roshi, you probably remember, uh, doing glass as well. We did glass and metalwork as well. But um, they were, it, it was clay that, that kind of um, seduced my, my, um, my interest, yeah. Um, Car Caroline, you might put up a, a, an image of one of Catherine's um, contemporary pieces. Yeah, do you, yeah. Mm. Maybe one of the pieces from the show. Mm. There we go. Yeah. So Catherine, just um, thank you so much for that. And, and, and maybe just um, before you finish up, could you tell us a little bit about those extraordinary forms um, those folds, and I know you're very influenced by the writing of Giles Deleuze, um, uh, but the whole notion of pleats and folds, just if you could tell us a little bit about that. Sure, I'd, I'd love to talk about that. I mean, obviously, there are huge references to landscape in my work, um, and, and uh, you know, throughout art school, we were also, we were drawing a lot from the human figure as well, so landscape and, and, and the body were important as well, but um, uh, yeah, when my uh, daughter was small, I was part of a reading group at, in the university in Galway. Um, it was uh, part of women's studies and um, myself and my colleague Vivian Dick and a, um, a poet, Mary Dempsey, and um, uh, various um, theorists were, we used to sit around a table once a week um, and try and dissect Deleuze and Guattari uh, and um, I just found that in relation to philosophy I kind of read it more visually than, than because I, I lacked a, a, a theoretical background and um, it was quite a bit after that that I discovered um, uh, the fold Deleuze's um, 
treatise on, on this notion of the pleats of matter. Um, it actually comes out of, in a way, um, Baroque architecture and observing of, of, of the folds in relation to Baroque uh, architecture. But um, uh, it's always very nice uh, to dip into uh, or uh, read some, some text that somehow relates to how you um, see things. And uh, so Deleuze has been particularly important in that way. And, you know, that no notion of pleats, I suppose it's something that we learn uh, from our very early days of looking at sculpture. You know, if you think about the Greek and Roman figures, you know, with all those folds and pleats in their beautiful um, kind of uh, uh, clothes, you know, drapes. Um, that that became very important to me. The notion of matter itself is kind of so intrinsically linked to 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 clay as a material. So that's that's very important as well. And then just some of the uh, the text in relation to Deleuze, um, I might just quote very briefly um, uh, uh, what he says about matter. Um, matter thus offers an infinitely porous, uh, spongy or cavernous texture. Uh, caverns endlessly contained in other caverns. No matter how small each body contains, a world pierced with irregular passages, surrounded and penetrated by an increasingly vaporous fluid. So, so that, that notion of matter and uh, fluidity and solidity um, and uh, shapes within shapes, you know, when I started to read that, it's like, well, that's fine. You know, that's kind of what I'm, you know, uh, you know, what the work is about, do you know? Uh, so it was lovely just to find a kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, some text that, that, that inspired me to continue thinking about those kinds of, um, interior um, uh, passages and forms and so uh, a lot of my work over the last maybe um, eight years or so has been a, a lot about housing a form within a form and these double walled forms and um, so uh, that's that's been you know it's still something that fascinates me really that's wonderful, Catherine, and thank you so much for that. Um, no doubt there'll be lots of questions at the end and we can expand more on that, but that was such a wonderful insight. Uh, so thank you. Um, I'm now going to ask our second um, designer, artist, uh, Hugo Byrne, um, to, to speak to us. I'm just going to introduce Hugo um, by, by saying that he uses traditional and contemporary techniques um, to make his handcrafted knives. Um, they are not only uh, very functional and ergonomic, but they are also very, very beautiful objects as well. Um, so he incorporates material, um, you know, 6,000 year old bog oak, uh, which is quite extraordinary from Glenstall Abbey, for example, in some of the handles, pear wood from his own garden, um, and found materials um, from beachcombing uh, as well. So. Um, Hugo is uh, the son of two of Ireland's uh, well-known uh, artists, uh, Mike Byrne, the well-known ceramic artist, and Mary Nagel, visual artist. So um, what I would love, Hugo, um, you're also an award winner, I should say, as well. You won the Future Makers Award in 2019, um, and you also won the Image Interiors and Living Magazine Award, the Emerging Makers Award as well. Um, and you've also received um, an award from Limerick City County Council. So um, just to kind of mention that as well. But could I ask you to begin by maybe telling us a little bit about the culture of making for you in your family, growing up with uh, two artists as parents, with, with Mary and Mike as artists, and maybe you could share that with us. Yeah, um, well, we, um, we did indeed grow up. So Mary and Mike are both, they're both recently retired, but um, uh, had worked in the art college here in Limerick for most of their lives. And so they went to the art college and then they moved to, to Kil Kilkenny, to Butler House, I think, is that right? Um, so they spent many years there. So they're, I was talking about Kilkenny very fondly, um, which I think is gas. It's kind of a nice little full circle there. But um, there was always, 
there was always never any pressure on my sister or I to be, you know, to to follow a particular path or anything like that. They had a very lax, not lax, but sort of gentle um, approach to things like homework and schoolwork and that kind of thing. And there was always very much, there was always loads of room for expression and trying things out and, you know, mistakes, really. Um, now, I always joke about like, oh God, if I'd have, if I'd have wanted to become a solicitor or something, I wouldn't have stood a chance, you know, I wouldn't have been allowed, but I would have, of course, but you know, <laughs> it was never gonna happen. Um, but, um, so we were always kind of making things as kids and all that sort of stuff. And then, you know, in school, we were, you know, lots of emphasis on art and music and that sort of thing. My sister Theo is a, she's a professional musician now. So, you know, um, there wasn't any particular, you have to do ceramics at all either, you know. Um, it was kind of whatever whatever you were having yourself so that was very good i think and i also did, that they were both teachers i think was quite formed in that um neither of them they were you know teachers are always very careful not to not to just insist that their students do this and this and this there's like there's guidance but there's also a certain amount of um letting you go your own and fail or succeed in whatever whatever you're whatever you choose to do, you know what I mean? So it, it was handy that they weren't just artists and designers and craftspeople, but that they also were teachers. So there was, um, it was very much, you know, there was, um, they were quite good at, at letting us find our own paths, as well, if that makes sense. It does, and that, well, that leads me to ask you, how did you find your path or your journey into, into knife making? Um, it was around about enough. I went to NCAD, which was loads of crack. It was an absolute great time. Um, I studied sculpture, which I thought I couldn't. I didn't really know what to do at the end of first year. I thought, oh, wow. I'm not really sure what what I want to do. I'll do sculpture, where you can kind of do anything. You know what I mean? You don't have to. You know, it's a bit like kind of more multimedia, um, um, which was loads of fun. But I think was the wrong course for me in that. I kind of thought, I want to make things, you know what I mean? I want to make things. And then I found in sculpture that you, before you made something, you had to have quite a good reason to do it, to want to do it, which I never had. Um, I was I was always more, um, oh, yeah, I'll just make it and work out the theory afterwards. It's all wrong, you know what I mean? So that was that was um, not a cr criticism of the course now at all, but it was I was the wrong guy for it. Um, so after that, I, I moved, I started working in a, in a restaurant, um, which was, lo again, loads of fun fairly difficult to stay creative while you're doing that. And after a few years there, I was going mad. Um, um, and I designed some furniture, just sort of as a little fun sort of creative project. I designed a few chairs to see really if, if this little design idea that I had would work. Um, and it didn't at the first, but believe it or not, they were extremely uncomfortable. Um, Cause I don't know the first thing about furniture design, but then I perfect, well, I got them a little bit right and made them and that kind of like sparked the bug of thinking creatively again, which was very exciting. Um, and off the back of that, I applied for a internship in a place called Conservation Letter Frack, which is out in Connemara. Um, and we went to visit the workshop. A friend of Mary and Mike's knew the knew the manager there and said, oh, you have to talk to Sven, you have to talk to Sven, he's fantastic, he's just a great guy, but, you know, he's just really kind of interested in everything. So I went in, we said hello, and I was totally seduced by the workshop. I, you know, um, I don't know the first thing about object conservation either, but I was just really, really amazed by all the machines and the tools and the diversity of the project that took place there, you know, restoring furniture or architectural joinery, you know, there was, there was, low, there was no, um, it wasn't just, we do wood turning here or we do this here you know it was it was a bit of everything it was really cool so while i was there they gave me a project to design some chopping boards um out of a few lumps of walnut that someone had dropped in they said oh there's a project for the intern you know have a little design challenge for you there um so i was kind of racking my brains thinking how am i going to do this you know, they're they're really perfect they're gorgeous lumps of wood as it is what, how am i going to adapt them um and then i kind of they're they're you know it's if I've, it felt a bit like trying to design the cart without the horse then in the end, you know what I mean? Like they were perfectly good chopping boards already. I would have just been spoiling them. Um, but it kind of, it felt silly designing the board without the knife to match. So I said to them, I said, actually, is there any chance I can maybe design a knife? And they were like, yeah, great. I think they were just thrilled. 
<laughs> you know, to give me something to do. Um, so they had all the gear and they had a forge. They had a load of books on steel and forging and, and knife making and things. And they were, uh, and, and I had nothing but time. So they were really, really, really on, encouraging about that. Just on that, Hugo, um, on, you mentioned forging steel. So, um, you know, for those of, for those in the audience kind of listening in, could you tell us a little bit about that process of forging, forging steel? I know you and I, when we spoke on the phone many months ago, I just found it so fascinating. Uh, it's a really intricate process. Could you, you know, tell us um, just a little bit about that process of actually making the steel? Yeah, um, I suppose what we were talking about before was making the Damascus, um, oh. which is the name for like a many layered, um, most like a, a laminated steel so uh, the way this is a photo actually from um was it last year the year before we went over to a guy called joel black he's a blacksmith over in the uk and made some steel with him um the way it works is so i work with carbon steels which are as opposed to stainless steels um, so they they patinate over time and that kind of thing damascus is made out of them and the way it works is you have two you have two different types of steel. So, you know, you have A and B, let's say, and you would have some flat bar of each and chop that up. So you would make a stack then. So you have A, B, A, B, A, B. That would all be welded together and then heated up to welding temperature in the forge, which is bright, bright yellow. And then under the power hammer, which you can see in the image here, you, you forge weld that together. So when you hit it hard enough, if it's hot enough, it'll stick. And you squish it out into a big flat uh, bar. And then, so then you would have maybe, you would start off with 10 of 10 pieces of steel. So your stack would be 10 high, let's say. And you squish that out flat and then you chop that up again. I think that was chopped up into six. And we, that is stacked on top again and welded up. So you now have a 60 layer piece of steel, if that makes sense. 60 layers of A and B, A, B. And again, that was squished out. Um, and then you can, you can do that kind of indefinitely, as many layers as you like. I think we stopped at 60 for this one in the end. This knife here uh, is where that was coming from. Excuse me. So um, after the Damascus, we then got stainless steel and clad that on the outside and again swished, squished it all out so that we had a kind of a sandwich. What's called San Mai, which I think means three layers in Japanese. So you had some stainless steel, then the 60 layer Damascus in the middle and then stainless again on the outside. So that when you start to grind that and turn that into a knife, gradually the stainless is, is worn away on the bottom edge of the knife um, and reveals the Damascus. So I have a little scrap here, the stainless forge welding stainless steel is an absolute dose. And it delaminates like crazy and it's really, really difficult. So that was a huge piece and a lot of work. That was the steel I got out of it. So I have a little scrap here that's gone delaminated on me, but we might try a little acid etch for fun just to see if it'll reveal itself. So I'm not sure now, my camera's a bit dodgy, but you can see this kind of plain steel here. We'll dip it into the acid for a moment. See if it's gonna do anything. Um, it might not now, the acid is a little quite old and probably isn't warm as warm as it should be, but we'll see if you can make out the pattern as it emerges on the steel. Yes. Can you see there sort of, you can see the difference between the Damascus and the carbon? Yes. Um, so that's how that works really. Um, and that's what's involved in making Damascus steel. In. Hugo, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for that, that presentation. Sense. It does, it does. And it's great to see the demo. Um, no doubt there'll be lots of questions coming in around that uh, <laughs> uh, towards the end. So, so thank you very much. Um, I'm now just going to call on our third and final speaker, the artist Roisin de Butler, uh, to, to speak. So just by way of introducing Roisin, um, you know, she's, she's one of Ireland's um, kind of most renowned visual artists who works in a variety of medium, uh, media, um, in particular uh, glass. Uh, she works in layers of meaning using the material's inherent beauty and quality um, to draw the viewer in, into the work. Um, cultural heritage and shared histories are central to her practice and um, her father Eamon de Butler was a recognised musician and wildlife filmmaker and um, it's, the, it's Roisin's own cultural heritage and, and legacy um, that informs her, her work practice today and, and, and she's going to speak a little bit about that. Um, but just to say that Roisin graduated from the NCAD uh, also, and she teaches and lectures in glass here in Ireland and also internationally. And she works to uh, 
commission, public commission and private commission um, and exhibits internationally as well. And just if I can mention one of Roisin's uh, amazing projects is Islanders, uh, which was, she won an award for a Bonhams Award in 2019 and her Islanders project uh, took place at Venice last week um, uh, in Venice. And for those of you who want to find out more about that, I urge you to check out the Instagram page for it, um, which is Islanders, uh, Islanders Glass. Um, uh, so, so Roisin, thank you so much for, for being with us today. And um, maybe you can begin by telling us what it was like for you growing up uh, in, a, in a culture of making, uh, and particular around the music and the love of music uh, that you have and that your father had. Thanks. Uh, and, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to um, talk to you today. Um, yeah, the, 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 taking part in the exhibition has been a really interesting exercise for me um, to try and look back at a part of my father's history that um, is not spoken about probably as much as his wildlife filmmaking um, was. For people who don't know who he is, uh, uh, was um, he was Ireland's first natural history um, Eunice really is an independent filmmaker and spent um, the 1960s and 70s and uh, some of the 80s um, going around Ireland and showing Irish people what uh, the beauty of the natural landscape was and he was also an environmentalist in, the, in that he had a lot of campaigns going um, trying to prevent uh, destructive behaviours and talking about um, conservation before it was fashionable to talk about it. So um, alongside that and before that, um, he grew up on a river in the Darda Valley and um, what had salmon weir outside the window and was very close to nature, but music was also a huge part of his teenage years. And um, he became interested in uh, traditional music and bought uh, an accordion from um, somebody standing on a pound bridge, my mother told me the other day. Um, and uh, that's how he started playing the box, as we call it. And um, then uh, obviously was in town in the city playing with people in different pubs and um, met uh, a number of different musicians and met Sean O'Rea, the, the uh, great composer and um, a uh, classical um, musician and arranger um, who was also very, very interested in Irish music. And together, um, Sean O'Reilly was at that time uh, based in Coulé um, in, in Cork and my father was in, in the city. Um, he lived in, uh, and, uh, lived in Bray, but he spent a lot of the time in the city, he had a business there. And um, in 1961, they had this incredible uh, gathering of musicians under the name of Gilfrey Fulham. Um, and it was really, really groundbreaking at the time. It was led by Sean Arreda, but um, the musicians were made up of many of my father's friends who were from the city. And in this photograph that we have here with Paddy Baum, my father in the middle on the box, and Paddy Maloney on the right hand side there, whom you may know as the leader of the Chieftains. And um, what they were doing at that time was, Sean was arranging Irish music, traditional tunes, but also um, very, very ancient music um, of great harpers um, that had been kind of buried in books, which are now really well-known tunes um, by Carolyn, for example, um, some incredible uh, um, uh, jigs and reels that were, were being played only in kitchens up, up until that time. And what uh, Sean was trying to do by bringing it to the city was um, to bring it into a concert hall scenario. So in 1961, they made this uh, concert called Rapparacht and Riedig. And it wasn't just them, it was a number of different people. There were also poetry readings and um, Darach O'Cahan was there and um, <coughs> Maura McEntee read her, her poetry as well. And Kjoltri Fulan made their sort of debut in um, informal suits with Vicky Buzz. Now my father never wore a formal suit. Um, ever after that, but um, uh, they they sort of had to bring it. It was in the Shelburne Hotel, and they had to bring it as a sort of a grand performance. Some of you might have known, uh, you know, the sort of extraordinary sounds of Misha Eira that have been played over the last number of years. That Sean arranged all, uh, wrote and arranged all that music, and also made a lot of film different film scores. Um, but what's really interesting about this story was that, you know, we're so dependent on technology and here we are talking virtually. 
um, the growth of, of the learning of that music and how Sean actually shared his music with the band of musicians who were in Dublin were, were, was that Sean used to record on this kind of machine. Um, this is an Agra reel-to-reel -reel machine. And um, he used to make the recordings of all the arrangements that he had wanted the musicians, different musicians to play. So there were 11 or 12 musicians in the band. And um, he would send the tapes by post to my father. And my father would bring this small machine into the pubs uh, where they were practicing. It was uh, Papal Street, the Four Seasons Papal Street. And um, they would uh, play the tape and then the musicians would learn the parts from that. So an extraordinary kind of uh, slow weave, I suppose, is what you might call it. And here is a notebook of Dad's, um, of Dad's and his beautiful handwriting, um, where he made a lot of different notes about um, the kinds of music that, or the, the notes of, of different pieces of music that he had. And this kind of um, logging and noting exactly what was going on when all of the different musicians were playing became some of the texture of the music that they had. Um, I also have a small notebook here. Um, yeah, there's three or four um, versions of it there and also the programme from Rakharov and Riedic, which um, was going to be in the, in, the, um, in the exhibition. You can see there AABB um, on, the, on the notebook there, just uh, on, that, on that tune. And um, there are, in traditional music, there are sort of different parts of the music. Um, there is one phrase, uh, one series of phrases called A, which are classed as A, and then one series of phrases which are classed as B. And normally they're played A, B, A, B, A, B, or two lots of A and two lots of B in a session. But with Jean's um, arrangements, he was changing things around and in kind of a jazz uh, sort of way that people could then have solos um, where they were playing parts of the, of the, of the tune um, singularly and then you would have a number of instruments coming in and then you would have um, the whole band come in and it created this incredible electrifying atmosphere that had never been seen or heard before and at the time it was enormously um, groundbreaking. In 1963 my father, um, uh, all, they, they made this this is, this is reversed, it says Oria the Sugeti. Um, and on the back it says um, Tafa the Studio, Eamon de Butler, B.O. on Gaiety. And it was my father who actually recorded this uh, live in the Gaiety and um, Gaelin put it onto um, a record. And just, just how that legacy kind of carried on. So this is um, one of Dad's um, handwritten notebooks. And then later he um, formed a band after, after Sean died, um, the band split into two groups. So one became the Chieftains and they went on the road and you know, have made an incredible career of, of and brought so much to Irish music. And dad wanted to concentrate on his filmmaking. And so he um, created this band called Kill Three Line, which was a less uh, full-time occupation. But this notebook of which also um, there is a, a, a version in the, in the exhibition is also an incredible sort of um, recipe book for tunes and for arrangements because you know, in performance, you need to have a sequence of arrangements um, going along. So there are amazing um, groups of, of musical pieces in this. And this was put together by my aunt there were 15 of these hand-made, uh, linen-covered, um, made by my beautiful Aunt Nora um, Butler, who worked with my father as production assistant and uh, animator for many, many years. And um, this is a really treasured uh, poss possession that, uh, that we have um, in the family. So just from the point of view of, of what I was showing um, for the work uh, that I'm actually showing in the exhibition, um, it's a series of sound objects. And although the objects are there to be seen, what I'm also trying to do is to create this ethereal um, atmosphere through these um, performance of these pieces. So if you just go back to the art, uh, red, and uh, red and, and uh, purple piece, uh, Caroline. Um, these two pieces, so um, this is called Lift, the red one is called Lift. And my father used to describe when people were playing music, um, you know, if, if they weren't actually really feeling 
the music. There was no lift in the music. And in order to have a lightness and a kind of a something that was really descriptive within the music, um, he described this as a lift. And inside this piece, there is um, a whole series of small, tiny um, glass beads or bobble, you know, uh, uh, round pieces that actually make a sort of a swirling sound. And they also make a kind of, it's a bit like a rain, a rain stick sound as well. And you can also beat this piece and you can also blow into it. Likewise, the other piece behind. And in making this, um, these pieces, first of all, to hear the sound of glass or to create sound that's absolutely new um, because it is made of glass and the timbre of the sound changes with the thickness of the pieces. Um, I've been working with Liam and Lee and uh, Peter O'Toole and uh, Sheila Dinver, all contemporary musicians in, in Ireland, um, to make live performances using these pieces. And so um, bringing the fragility of the glass and the, um, the timbre, the tradition of, of, of working very intuitively with the, with the music and the material so that it becomes a conversation has been um, an amazing thing to do for the last uh, number of years. And I suppose I'm, I'm different, you know, in this scenario where these pieces have been shown before a number of times and I'm not selling this work. Um, so I'm working in a much more, in a much more sort of ethereal kind of way where I'm creating things that don't really exist and can't be re, remade or re, reconstituted because every performance is different. Um, and that depends on the dialogue between the, the musicians and the crowd. And that kind of goes back to what Kjolsvri Fulham were doing was really sort of drawing on the traditions of the crowd, but also reinventing the music um, so that it would become something very fresh and electrifying and very moving, um, you know, depending on, on the interaction with the audience. And so I suppose that just brings us back to the last slide that I have there of, um, of Alison Lowry's slide for Islanders, which was a project that we made in uh, Venice last year. And um, I suppose it's quite, it's quite um, relevant now because here we are, you know, more isolated than we ever were. And this piece was, um, this Islanders project was a response to the Brexit negotiations and how uh, um, isolated um, I was feeling um, as, the, as the discussions became more and more intense um, early on. And um, I reached out to island uh, makers around the world to put together a piece of work that would signify what, uh, what being an island meant to them. And um, so we made this incredible project, which was projected small um, slides, like a 35 mil slide, but made of glass, um, everybody's personal um, expression. And we projected that in a live um, performance on Murano um, in a very, very old site of an old glass factory um, last year. So I'm hoping to bring that elsewhere around the world. Oh, Roisin, thank you so much for that. Um, and it was actually really, uh, a mate, wonderful to hear the impact of your father's passion for music um, and con continue in your own work in this incredible way and it's the in performance and craft and object and I just loved what you said uh, his, own, his own words was the word lift when people are really feeling the music he used to call it lift and then your, your piece is entitled lift I just, that was gorgeous so so thank you very much for that presentation um, I'm just really conscious of time and I I'm going to just call on Caroline to um, there's probably some questions, Caroline, from our audience, is there? Caroline, can I just cut across there for a second? Yeah. Sorry, um, um, Marin, I, I, uh, Roisin, uh, actually everyone, that was, that, was, that was fantastic. And I think Roisin's, um, what Roisin spoke about, I mean, has especially reminded us of how embedded craft is in our wider cultural heritage in Ireland and how important it is. Um, I, I just want to ask one quest, question, if you don't mind, Marin, is just in relation, it's, Roisin again, especially speaking, reminded me of um, Glenn Adamson wrote an essay for the publication that accompanies this uh, this exhibition. He, he he talked about generation being a, a word that faces both ways, both past and present, and 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 all of your work is is innovative and it's forward thinking, especially Roisin and what you've done with sound objects. It's experimental, you know, and it's really you know it's really you know of now. But I I'm just you know how much that rely rely on the on 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 what's from the past the heritage what is passed down to you the knowledge and skills you know what you're doing is very forward thinking 
but you're using very ancient skills in some in some ways yeah it's trying to it's looking at how you can um reshape uh what you know i mean i i think that drawing on your past is a massive part of moving forward you know i think i i think that's that's what anchors me certainly um you know in in not only in my making but also in how i think and how i where that huge energy and emotion comes from in order to make um to make work but i think the making skills you know are are, are so important from the point of view of you know, having the experience of passing that down, whether that was, you know, my mother at home showing, showing me how to do things, um, you know, in a practical way. Um, uh, uh, Catherine was talking about the sewing machine there. We, we were, we were your sisters doing exactly the same thing, you know, whipping up a skirt before you go out to the disco or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, yeah, something that came very naturally. And it's something that I see a lot of people falling back on, um, you know, when, when, when COVID started, certainly all of that kind of going back into making became very significant. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we do have a question actually. Um, one question is for Hugo. It is how specialized is knife making and the, the Damascus still process? Um, are there many makers around the world doing this at the moment? Yes, there's loads. There are loads of makers around the world doing it. And there's actually surprisingly like quite a few in Ireland. Um, when I started maybe two years ago, I was like, oh, God, no one's doing this. But actually, there's a, a quite a there's quite a good few people um, doing it in Ireland at really amazing levels. Like um, I know Rory O'Connor, I think, was sort of the, he's sort of the Irish godfather of uh, knife making. He taught a guy called Fingal Ferguson, who is a real... A superstar these days um so there's there's they're well worth looking up there's a you know, sam gleason and claire Paddy ryan in limerick is amazing blacksmith uh turned kind of bladesmith uh who's making amazing work uh, so it's it's very specialized i think you know way back when i think the the local blacksmith was kind of like the local surgeon now you know it took seven years to get become a qualified blacksmith because you were making the tools that everyone was using excuse me so um while now it's a lot more like rocket science than it was back then, I think there's much more understanding about, you know, the chemical components and that kind of thing of steel and how, you know, you understand temperature is much better. Whereas in the past, you know, everything would have been done on the color of the steel as you heat it. You can say now it's at the right color, it's obviously at the right temperature. Whereas now, you know, you can kind of look at the recipe of um, the, what the steel is made up of and you know then how it should, how it should heat treat or how it should anneal, that kind of thing. So, but at the same time then you can, you can make a knife you can make a knife out of mild steel and just whack it enough times with a hammer or file it with a with a file and it's you know once it's heat treated it's a knife it's it's no longer a soft piece of steel it's a hardened piece of steel so you can make it into a blade that will hold an edge but depending on how you know depending on how you heat treat it how well it's done how it's tempered the type of steel it is in the first place uh within that there's an awful lot of um range for how decent a knife is going to be you know what i mean Hugo, so, we have another question for you also. It is, on reflection of the development of your work to date, can you recall your most enjoyable moments of inventiveness? Um, I know. Specific, I, I don't know. I, that's a good, I don't know, that's a, it caught me off guard there. But can I, I suppose, add something to that, Hugo, which yeah. I think would be really interesting. What's really, a really interesting aspect of your work and something you share with both Mike and Mary is this use of found objects and maybe just to mention that as well in your answer. Yeah, um, well I suppose in terms of uh, the, with the original question, in terms of my creativity, I couldn't tell you, but just regard to knife making, there was a real, an amazing moment was after I made my first knife. Um, delighted I'd made this and I said oh I'll, I'll make my dinner with it and that was a real aha moment the whole uh, I made this thing and I spent weeks making it and was really excited and that was exciting enough that was good enough for me you know but then when I took it home I used it to cut up my dinner which I then ate and enjoyed and that was like oh my goodness I gotta get to use this every day and I still use it every day and I, I still use the first one I made but that you know that the 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 effect of like, here's a thing that didn't exist a couple of weeks ago, and then I created it, and now I get to enjoy using it every day until I lose it, you know what I mean? Which is, just, that, was a, that was amazing. 
I've found objects. Um, I think the three, I don't know, the, again, the first, the first knife that I made, actually, the first knife that I made wasn't a knife at all. It's what's called a KSO, which stands for a knife-shaped object, um, because it was unhardened steel. I was waiting for decent steel to arrive in the post, so I made this little oyster knife out of, um, out of mild steel, unhardened. Um, and actually, when I tried to open oysters with it, the knife, the blade was like, <laughs> the, the oysters is too much for it. But um, that was made from driftwood, which I found at the beach that I was living near in Connemara. Um, and I thought, oh, lovely. I, went, I used to go swimming there every day. And it was a beautiful piece of wood. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if I could make a knife using this piece of wood and then get some oysters, maybe from this beach, and eat them on the beach. And uh, that was that was something really nice and kind of full circle. Something romantic, I guess. It was, it was quite a romantic thing. Um, that at the time I was just delighted with. You know, I'd moved from Dublin out to the ends of the earth in Connemara. I was just so thrilled about the whole thing that there was a lovely, uh, that was a lovely way to end my time there, you know, with this, uh, with my driftwood knife. Mm. So we'll, we'll pretend did an amazing job at opening the oysters. <laughs> Um, Roshan, we have a question. Thank you so much, Hugo. Roshan, we have a question um, d uh, towards you. It is, um, how, can you comment on how your, practice has, how your practice has changed over time? So you spoke about a lot, a lot about your father's work, but your, your work is very varied. Yeah, it has. Um, well, I suppose the only consistent thing is, um, that I can, well, there are a number of consistent things, but the material is the consistent element. And I suppose um, when I started off, I started making uh, bowls and uh, functional wear um, when I worked in lots of different studios around the world for other people, you know, that, that was uh, a kind of a stable, I actually had an agent in England at one point um, working for me. I think that would be a really good thing to bring back again, agents that actually go around and do the selling for makers. Mm. So I think it's a very underestimated idea. Um, but even very early on, I was making sculptural pieces with water and colour and stacking and doing sort of different kind of experimental works. And I think what's really interesting to see when I look back over the work, because um, my work ranges from, you know, small objects to very large architectural scale work. Um, it's really to do with, with light and shadow and storytelling. Um, and the anchor is the, is the cultural aspect of it. When I'm working on larger scale projects, I'm re responding to a site or I'm responding to a brief of some kind or other. And, uh, you know, that can change the, the, um, the content, but it certainly always has a storytelling narrative um, kind of uh, aspect to it. And that is very much embedded in, in my own history um, and the history and culture of, of, of the country. Thanks, Roshan. Um, I have just a question or, or two, if, if that's okay. Um, and this is for all of the panelists. The first one is just, um, I suppose, whether you could comment on, on the broader um, impact in terms of your ethos, values and approach to life um, that growing up in a, in a creative environment has had. Um, and the other one is just in relation to the, the ongoing um, sharing and transfer of skills. And you know whether there is the moment where the digital environment, in terms of tutorials on on YouTube or these kind of um, webinars, uh, the role that they have to play in in terms of maybe encouraging younger generations to um, have an interest in the making process, uh, and maybe what needs to happen then to to actually get them from just looking online to actually making uh, for themselves. Maybe that's one. Catherine, could, could, could we ask Catherine to answer that one first, just in relation to uh, education as well and GMIT? Uh, yeah, well, uh, there's certainly, um, I, I think it's really interesting at the beginning of the whole COVID thing, people started to bake and bake and bake, you know, and we did that here as well. <laughs> and it was that thing of kind of um, wanting to produce things, I think, you know, and to feel, uh, I think people needed to feel to feel like they were generating uh, things at home, from home, you know. Um, I, I, I don't know. Um, I think it depends very much on the individual as to how much they relate to making uh, on, you know, in relation to material online and things like that. I know my brother Richard pretty much taught himself how to um, uh, turn wood from, from YouTube, you know. Uh, he... he 
he he's very much somebody who observes and interprets um, from material in front of him. Um, but I think I think people work in lots of different ways. Um, my experience from um, teaching. Uh, in GIT is, you know, a lot of people would come to art school with all kinds of ideas as to what they might want to do. Um, but a lot of people have very little experience of working three-dimensionally because um, our school system doesn't really uh, nurture that as much as working two-dimensionally. So if you think about from when you're very young, you learn how to um, make marks on a piece of paper, you know, and create illusion on a piece of paper, but you don't really always get exposure to um, working with materials and what's really interesting I always find that very interesting when I used to teach first years uh, um, uh, would be the, the you know the, the aspirations that people had you know mostly when people came to art school they would have um, been exposed to painting you know and many of the, the people who came to art school wanted to work in painting or maybe textiles um, but then uh, some discovered this third dimension, you know, and they couldn't go backwards again, really. And uh, so that's that's very interesting. Um, but I think that uh, making has been taken out of education, really, um, a huge part of the, the notion of making um, in primary education. And I think that that's a huge loss. Um, uh, we did a huge amount of making in, in primary school. Um, uh, we did a huge amount of sewing with 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 them. Um, I, I was taught by nuns, and they were they you know they they were wonderful because every now and then it was all about switching off and simply making things. So you had you had whole afternoons where all you had to do was make things all day, um, and that doesn't exist in in um, primary ed ed education anymore. And, uh, you know, uh, those days when you'd be just working with materials all day, you know, now the, the children are very programmed and um, it's almost like in, in, in the school system, it's very like the modular system. It's, it's, it's not necessarily about making these lateral connections. It's lots of different subjects and everything's very compartmentalized. And I think that's very, very difficult. I think if we could move back to a more lateral kind of model of education would be, be great. But uh, there were a couple of things that were really interesting in terms of what Hugo was saying um, in terms of making. Um, one was the, the notion of colour in relation to forging metal. And um, there's also a lovely connection there where, um, uh, you know, originally people fired kilns using colour. And if you fire on a very regular basis, you manage to read the colour uh, associated with different temperatures, you know, and, uh, you know, people talk about red heat and, and all these different uh, temperatures. And I thought as well, you know, that thing of a kind of a, uh, you know, whether one, one, one reaches an epiphany at some point, you know, I, I remember that joy of making something functional, actually, Hugo, um, that you were describing. And, uh, uh, that idea, I think, I, I, particularly when I studied in France, um, even though I was, you know, making sculpture by then, um, uh, my, my, my teacher there, uh, Michel Danmarch, he, he insisted, he was the professor of ceramics, he insisted that we all uh, make, use the wheel as well. So I just had to make vessels, I had to make, um, I made hundreds of tea bowls and jugs and things like that. And I lived in a flat where uh, we had nothing. So all my vessels were the vessels we, we used in ape farm. And when I went to see people, I would just give them a, <laughs> a vessel. <laughs> uh, but that joy of kind of drinking and eating out of something that you've made yourself, I think that's, that's, that's something that um, I think everybody should be able to experience, you know, uh, using something that they've made and that it, you know, and there's a great joy in, in that. The novelty doesn't seem to wear off. Either. Well, it hasn't for me yet. It's still as no, no. I, I, yeah, I, I, I don't throw very often. I throw for the students, and then I, I, I you know, I, I often don't even borrow clays that I throw. You know, but um, when I do, I'm still kind of, you know, thrilled. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I made, made something that works. <laughs> so, so nice. It was just like a question for you, Catherine. Yeah.
from there was a question for Catherine there from Hilary Morley. Just, the last point, uh, before she wants to put on for a second. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to just come in on that last uh, last question there, Louise, that you asked, because it's a, it's pretty interesting to see um, what's actually happening. Just that you had two questions. So one, what was, you know, as a child, what was the influential thing? I think what was extraordinary about my, my what I learned as a child very, very early on was that I had a voice that um, my father used to ask us to critique uh, his program after we watched it. And he would want to hear what my seven-year-old voice had to say and my opinion counted. And I think to be listened to was something that was extraordinary at the time. And I hope I've been able to carry that on. Um, and secondly, just in, the, in, the, uh, in relation to your question about online um, interactions, I think it's incredibly difficult to, um, to teach something at the moment. I've, I've been interviewing a number of of artists who are teaching in, in institutions um, to try and teach something through glass um, online is, is extraordinarily difficult when you can't get to the material. But um, the Glass Art Society, which is the biggest glass conference, um, annual glass conference, is held in different places around America and around the world. Um, uh, and it has thousands of people who come and visit it and interactions with many different artists. And they're going online tomorrow for the first time ever in their history. And it's a three day a three day conference, and there are sign ups, and there are YouTube channel um, streaming, and all that kind of thing. And in one way, it's it's um, opened up the whole thing for people all over the world to be able to interact with it. Um, it's going to be a massive teaching tool and a connection tool. Um, it doesn't replace actually physically going to the conference and you know making all that incredible networking. But it is actually networking in a different kind of way. And already we're making links with people through, you know, looking forward to different presentations and keying into different presentations. So I think it's an opportunity um, that we may not have thought about, um, which may open up things, certainly from the point of view of being able to rewind stuff and look at it again. And, you know, for Irish music, for example, there are incredible channels that you can learn instruments um, in a project base and I see Martin Hayes has just launched his uh, classes now as well so I think that you know this opportunity has brought a whole different kind of level given that you could get to your studio and you know do things step by step and you had a good team of people you know as a filmmaker's daughter I just see terrible films an awful lot of the time and you know it just drives me absolutely crazy but um, <laughs> Uh, I think that there is a massive opportunity there, but I think that also people really need to feel and see and engage, you know, with the material themselves to really have the understanding. And I think that having an opportunity as a child to engage, if you ask, you know, the, ma the majority of makers will have had some kind of really deep engagement with the material. It may have been a visit to a workshop once, or it may have been a long um, relationship with with a maker the same kind of thing with a gardener or a baker or a chef you know you have this very resonant experience as a child that then stays with you for the rest of your life and makes change make you make decisions later on about how you're going to you know follow that path yeah thanks Roshan I, I totally agree I think you need both but actually there's a huge opportunity now in in terms of the audiences that we can reach um, and I suppose just just the um, the realization uh, of the global audience um, and how much we can interact online so um, I, I might try and ch tune into Glass Art Society a little bit tomorrow if that's possible. Yeah there's plenty on there's plenty on uh, on online you can just go on into Glass Art Society but really exciting I know I know from one of the names coming up on the screen that we're talking to somebody in New York um, you know it may be it may be amazing to hear where people are from and where they've logged into from um, for this uh, seminar and hello from Dublin. Mm -hmm. Great. I think Susan was there another question there? Yeah, there was just a couple of questions in, one from Hilary, uh, Hilary Morley there, and she was putting this question to all the panel, actually. Um, how has COVID-19 impacted your creativity? Anyone like to take that? Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I think COVID-19 is such a huge challenge, isn't it? Um, I think uh, what's very challenging is um, what Roisin was alluding to, the whole notion of something being experiential. 
and also the tactile, you know, um, that's something that we've been worrying terribly, uh, you know, as, as, as a faculty, teaching faculty at, at we've been worried terribly about how how that can continue that experiential notion um, uh, during COVID-19. Um, uh, it, 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 it's an enormous challenge, I think, um, but it's also, I suppose, in, in, a, in a kind of abstract way, it's what you always wish for, that everything would close down and that you could just live in your own space and and, and 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 make and um, you know there's so many things that just use up so much time every day normally like commuting and you know all those kinds of things and um, you know I, I, I suppose this COVID-19 uh, can be seen as an opportunity in terms of um, simplifying one life, one's life you know and distillating dis distilling um, it into the kind of elements that really matter to you as an individual. Um, but obviously you don't, you can't control all those choices. Um, I'd certainly at this stage like to, 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 to you know, interact, you know, in a, in, a, in a real environment with people more, you know. But um, having said that, uh, uh, you know, I've certainly enjoyed, you know, uh, discussions with students and colleagues um, uh, through teams, you know, and those have worked quite well, I think, um, and discovered that we can do those. I think it's been good. That's great. Does anyone, does Hugo, do you want to come in on that point as well? How was um, how for you? Your studio a, was in your garden. Yeah, I know. I'm very, very lucky in that regard, but it's just a, a funny note when you said, how has it affected your creativity? At the start of this, this lockdown, you know, uh, like um, Catherine, you were saying, everyone, everyone has taken up baking in the world. You know, you can't get flour for a load of money. But I remember when this lockdown came, I kept thinking like, oh God, this is great. What am I gonna, what, what extracurricular activity am I gonna take up with all this free time, you know? I was so excited. And I was having to sort of getting up and go to work every day and working away and finish up the evening and going, okay, extra time. So, but um, I don't actually have any free time with it because I'm still, I'm still working away as many, as much as usual. So. I'm kind of sickened in that regard because uh, I'd love to be like, oh, great, I'll take up the piano. Now's the time. But um, at the same time, like, you know, I know how lucky I am to be able to keep working, doing something that I love as well. Um, it's great, you know, so uh, it's pretty, I'm, I'm very lucky in that regard. That's great, Hugo. And, and Roisin, for you? Uh, for me, it's it's been a bit of a roller coaster, to tell you the truth. Um, uh, I I couldn't get to my studio um, once the lockdown happened, and as I understood, it was it was coming in. My projects were folding um, one by one, and mm. a lot of them have to do with building sites. And you know, so obviously building sites have have reopened now, so the projects are going to be delayed, which means your finances are, are you know are delayed, etc. And and then performances and other interactive projects have closed, absolutely shut down without, you know, without being postponed because of not knowing how, you know, how it's going to ride out um, in those gatherings of, of people and festivals and all that kind of thing. So initially that was, that was an enormous shock. And then the next sort of wave that came was this expectation of being creative and, um, you know, this time that you had been waiting for to be creative where you didn't have um, projects that you were trying to, you know, reach deadlines and stuff. And um, I found that actually, you know, sort of trying to trust the process that, you know, while living in this kind of mad drama of what was happening to the world and where we were going, um, you know, not, not feeling creative and feeling a responsibility of not feeling creative, not being able to get to the studio, not being able to make, you know, everything kind of uh, tumbling into itself. And so, you know, I think, I think we have to be honest as well about, you know, we, we react to things given time to percolate and, you know, it may be fine if you have a product that you're, you know, trying to re, remake or that you have a series of kind of deadlines that you're, you're working with and you have materials in front of you, but it's, it's not that easy when you're working in a, in a kind of a very abstract way. Um, I travel a lot for uh, reaching studios and making work and, collaborations with lots of different people internationally and so you know that whole world has kind of shifted completely for me um, and I, I have been you know ama amazingly able to to create some pieces but it's not in a showboating kind of uh, way it's very very personal responses to 
to my own trauma, I suppose, and what I've been experiencing. Um, but I think it'll be really interesting to see what comes out of this. What I do see is that there is far more humanity and uh, community um, awareness and certainly a huge uh, awareness of our environment and what that brings um, when we stop and get off this wheel we've been on um, for a very long time. There's one last question there and that's from Patricia Duff. Um, at what point did Catherine Hugo and Roisin realized that they were carrying forward the legacy of their parents as creators? I think probably from the day I could speak, I would say. I learned to speak Irish as my first language, so that has been a legacy from the very beginning, you know, continuing the language and then working through that the whole cultural aspect has been absolutely embedded from the day I was born, I think. I suppose uh, myself, uh, not too long ago now, when I moved home from Dublin, I moved home just for the summer between jobs. I was working in television and uh, I said, I'll move home for the summer and make a few knives uh, and wait for season four to be approved. And season four didn't get approved. So I ended up staying here and making knives uh, full time. But moving back in with Mary and Mike was... Um, was cool. I didn't think it would be, but actually it is. Um, it's quite cool living living with the two of them because they're working all the time as well. So there's quite a very, really, there's a real creative hot pot um, at home, you know what I mean? And we bounce, bounce things off each other an awful lot, and help each other out, which is great. So I think that from that, I've kind of realized that it's, uh, you know, that uh, like I, it's been, it's much more, um, it's much clearer that, oh, but here's why I got all these skills. And, you know, that's kind of, it was always going in that direction, you know, so that's, uh, that's quite cool. Yeah, I think, I think for me, uh, I think um, the kind of various languages, um, I, I was very interesting that, that, that Roshi spoke about her first language, but there are languages and ways of communicating communicating that you that you that forge particular links between your parents for you as individuals and um, I think probably every child in a family has a particular link or way of doing that you know depending on what their their thing is and I think I think for me uh, as a as a you know a person growing up um, my kind of link to my mother was that that, that visual preoccupation uh, with with drawing and looking, and um, uh, you know that was that was my little line of communication with her. Oh, thank you all so much for that. I think. Um, I, I think that's just been wonderful, and I'm just conscious we've gone uh, quite a lot over time, so. Um, I might just draw draw the discussion to a close, if that's okay. Um, unless, Francis, was there any final question from, from you? No, I suppose I just wanted to mention we, we did have eight exhibitors in, um, in Generation and uh, two of them were unable to participate in the seminar today. I mentioned Ryan Connolly earlier and I guess we just want to mention Ella Sinkovich as well. Um, Ella um, was from Belarus, am I right, Marin? Sorry. Um, yeah. Northern she, Ukraine. Studied, she, she studied in NCAD and um, I, I, I think has, has looked very much to a material she would have been familiar with growing up, which was felt, um, and this lovely pair of uh, boots that, that she inherited from uh, her family. Um, but she reinterpreted this material in a completely new, fresh and unexpected way created these wonderful garments that are, uh, that are uh, probably the first thing you see when you came through the archway to, to head to the exhibition. So I just want to give Al a mention as well. That's great. Yeah, thank, thanks for the work with, with all of you, with Roisin and Hugo and, 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 and Catherine. Uh, it, it's, it's lovely to, to see your work and, and to learn something new about you and, and the way you work and, and what, is, it's what has inspired you. And, uh, and of course, working with Marit, as always. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, just to echo that, thank you, Roisin, Catherine and Hugo. 
Um, like it has been a privilege to listen to you and to share your stories that are both professional stories, but also deeply personal stories. And um, so thank you so much for that. And we hope and pray and cross our fingers and everything on toes that we will have a get together and be able to celebrate the exhibition um, at some point in the future in, in Kilkenny in the National Design and Crafts, uh, Crafts Gallery. Um, but for those of you listening, it is, it is virtual at the moment and it is online on NDCG. Um, but hopefully I look forward to seeing you all, all in the future to celebrate in person. Can I just say thank you to um, all the participants today, to um, Francis and Maureen for chairing the two really informative and, and enjoyable panels and uh, we will be sharing the recordings. Uh, the first one is already up on ndcg.e forward slash learn forward slash adults um, and the next one will be following and there's lots of great content from the makers there too and it's been a privilege to be part of it today. Thanks very much, everyone. Really appreciate it. Cheers. It's been a pleasure. Until, until the real lifetime. It'll be great. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.